The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive, home of the Name Your Price tool. You say how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote. Visit Progressive.com to get started. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Diplua. We're the hosts of the Strictly Stalking Podcast. Strictly Stalking is a true crime podcast exploring stalking stories told by the survivors in their own words. Join us every Tuesday as we interview survivors, advocates, and experts to give you a deep dive into the workings of a true stalking case. Hear from these survivors as they describe how they fought back, got justice, and lived to tell their story. Stalking is a crime that can happen to anyone for any reason at any time. Is someone watching you, listening to you, following you, or even hiding in your house? It can happen to you. Would you know where to turn if you or someone you know has a stalker? We'll give you the resources you need to get help if you're a victim of a stalker. Find Strictly Stalking wherever you listen to podcasts. From Podcast One. Do you want to know what it's like to hang out with MS-13 in El Salvador? How the Russian Mafia fought battles all over Brooklyn in the 1990s. Or what about that time I got lost in the Burmese jungle hunting the world's biggest meth lab? Or why the Japanese Yakuza have all those crazy dragon tattoos? I'm Sean Williams. And I'm Danny Gold. And we're the host of the Underworld Podcast. We're journalists that have traveled all over, reporting on dangerous people and places. And every week, we'll be bringing you a new story about organized crime from all over the world. We know this stuff because we've been there. We've seen it. And we've got the near misses and embarrassing tales to go with it. We'll mix in reporting with our own experiences in the field, and we'll throw in some bad jokes while we're at it. The Underworld Podcast explores the criminal underworlds that affect all of our lives, whether we know it or not. Available wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our look at the Marion Barter case. and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my smashing co-host, Alice. Smashing! I didn't smash smashing. anything Smashing! So that's a good thing. Yeah. I, felt I like saw it. you. You were kind of upset a couple times. I thought you might smash something or somebody. I was a little fiery today, you know? You're a little fiery today. When you people... Are don't do their jobs it makes me fiery yeah, the boss man guys it's uh <laughs> it's something uh anyway no, no not at all and the person that who wasn't mm-hmm. doing their job was it you you'll never know that's also true that's also <laughs> true so <clears throat> not that i would admit it if it were but I, anyway so we're back today to talk more about marion barter i'm not going to try to pronounce her name with an australian accent accent today because alice made fun of me <laughs> did you just do that on purpose no anyway alice so we got it we got to get into this no, no you can't you can't make fun of me that, that can't be the whole podcast people get upset i'm not making fun of you okay everyone can everybody know how committed you are to this podcast you are sick and you're you crawled out of bed to say let's record and that's, i that's of true. course had to say yes even though you know, I wanted to just veg out on the couch because you crawled out of bed. I just, you know, I got to find through it. I've been sick a lot lately. So if we never recorded when I was sick, we just never record. So we got to fight through. It's like that person who left the review talking about how you sound like you have a cold when you record and you were literally recording with COVID. It's like, yeah, jerk. I hope, I hope people know that. Like, cause we recorded a bunch of the John Bonet Ramsey rep- episodes all together, you know, uh, during the holidays when we were 
it's quote unquote taking time off so that we would have enough episodes for you all when we were in trial. And I had COVID through like a half, maybe more than half of the recordings and people made fun of me. They're like, geez, she has such a nasal voice. I was like, no, I was dying. <laughs> I know, I know. It just goes to show you never know what somebody's going through. So maybe you should, you know, withhold your comments, random internet posters, <laughs> unless you do, which we're not, you know, I'm sure whoever left that comment is not actually a listener of the show because our <laughs> listeners would never do something like that. So. Never. Okay. Now back anyway, to Mary and Barger. We have, we have passed far down the rabbit trail. We're going to get back. On to the topic at hand, Marion Barter, because I know you guys are all excited to find out more about this crazy case. The last time we left you, we were in the middle of the timeline. We're up to 2019, basically the present, when Channel 7 News in Australia launches the Lady Vanishes podcast, which is the podcast we've been talking about a lot. It becomes a sensation in Australia and soon around the world. With pressure mounting on the New South Wales police, an investigation is launched into its missing persons division. So the Lady Vanishes is not only bringing up questions about the handling of Marion Barter's case, it's bringing up questions about the entire New South Wales Police Department. And this investigation actually leads to the discovery that there are some serious deficiencies in how the department is handling these cases. They're not taking them seriously. They're not following up on them. And the unit is eventually disbanded and reorganized. The new unit that comes in with new leadership launches a new investigation into Marion's disappearance. And soon, for the first time, remember this is 2019. She went missing in 1997. For the first time, she is officially listed on the National Missing Persons Register. As the podcast uncovers more information, a request is made for a coroner's inquest. We're going to talk more about what that is later in this episode. In 2020, on August 16th, the New South Wales coroner announces there will be an inquest. It begins on June 21st, 2021, and it is ongoing to this day. So if you listen to the Lady Vanishes podcast, you're in the middle of the inquest. It's currently on a break. There will be new hearings, which I'm very much looking forward to at the end of April of this year, 2022. Brett, can you tell us more about that? Because I just don't know much about the Australian way of starting inquests. Who can request an inquest? What exactly is an inquest? How is it different from the initial investigation? And is there any, you know, are there, are there parameters that are different for an, for an inquest than there are for the initial investigation that would follow kind of what we think of the normal path with a court system? So in Australia and in a lot of countries, I don't think anywhere in the United States, but there is a coroner's inquest that can be held whenever there is a death that calls for some investigation. So if there's any level of suspicion or question, there's going to be a coroner's inquest. I'm not sure if every death results in a coroner's inquest, and some of them are just so brief and sort of perfunctory when it's very obvious that someone's died of natural causes or something along those lines that they don't really hold them then. But I know whenever there is any suspicion of a, a foul play or any unusual aspects to a death, there can be a coroner's inquest. Obviously, the family can request one, but often they're done sort of just as a matter of law. There's a couple things you have to show. Number one, you have to show the person is likely deceased, and you have to show that there's some connection to the coroner in where, whatever area they are. And then, like I said, there's some reason to take a look at the case. In Marion's circumstance, the first prong was actually the most difficult. Was she deceased or not? Now, there had been no indication that she was alive in 22 years, but because the whole idea is that she's trying to disappear, she's trying to start a new life, there was a real question about whether or not that hurdle could be crossed. But because of some of the things that were uncovered by the Lady Vanishes podcast and some of the unusual aspects, the coroner decided to go ahead and hold this inquest. And an inquest, the closest thing I can compare it to is a grand jury where the outcome is some determination of, of whether the death is suspicious instead of an indictment. So when you go before a grand jury, the whole point is, are we going to indict someone for a crime? 
That's what we're looking at in a grand jury. And I would also invite barristers from Australia. If you want to write in on how we're getting this completely wrong, feel free. This was my best effort at figuring out exactly how this works in any event. So what the coroner is looking at, is there a suspicious death here? Is there a reason to think that a crime has been committed and the coroner has many of the same powers as a grand jury. He or she can call witnesses, interrogate them, and indeed force them to testify, even if that testimony would be incriminating against them. Now, in the United States, we have the Fifth Amendment, which prevents you from being forced to give incriminating testimony. Interestingly, and I actually kind of feel like the Australian system may have the better part of this, they can force you to testify, but they can't actually use any of that testimony against you later on at trial. So it's sort of a truth finding exercise, but obviously if you force someone to testify, they can give you information that may eventually lead to, to things that you could use against them. So it is a less of a protection than we have in the United States, but it is nice that in Australia, you can bring people in that you think are suspects and really just grill them about anything you want to ask them and they can't refuse to answer. They have to answer you. So that's what's going on in Australia, even as we speak. Brett, that's such an interesting, I mean, it, as a prosecutor, that's fantastic. I think all sides, oftentimes we think, oh, if this person can just give me that information, even if it's against their interest, it will help us solve this mystery, this crime, this unsolved crime. But we also actually have this conversation a lot when we have a witness who can't assert the Fifth Amendment because they can't be prosecuted. It's not against their interest in a prosecutorial way, but we 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 hesitate to call someone who doesn't want to testify. Let's say someone who is in love with the defendant, you know, either they have a child with them, they are their girlfriend, their wife, something like that. Wife is a little bit different because you have protections with uh, spousal privilege, but let's say a girlfriend, we often say, you know, the, your, your baby's mama, they, they may have ties and not want to testify, even though they have no assertion of any sort of privilege not to testify. But if we know they don't want to testify, we sometimes think, huh, do we want to force them because they may not give us, they may not actually be helpful for us because they may be fighting us on the stand so much. So it's an interesting question as to how that affects that sort of a calculus as the person asking the question of the person who doesn't want to be there. And I think people who aren't in the law don't understand that. I think it's a really good point. If you have a witness who is not invested in helping you, they're not going to come off well. They're not going to give you very good information. And you may find yourself in a really bad situation. You know, you call your own witness and you put them up on the stand and they're in front of a jury and you ask them a question and they answer it in the exact opposite way you wanted them to answer it. Now, what do you do in that situation? Then all of a sudden you're, you're stuck impeaching your own witness. You know, well, isn't it true that you met with some officers and you said the opposite thing of what you just said. And it, it looks like you're unprepared. It looks like you don't have control over your case. I think a lot of jurors would just dismiss at best, at best, dismiss the testimony of that person. And at worst, it actually hurts your case. And this is really important not to delve into this at all, but when the whole Chris Rock, Will Smith slap thing happened, people were saying, well, Will Smith should be prosecuted whether Chris Rock wants him to or not. And in reality, that's not going to work. If the person who got slapped doesn't want to testify, then what exactly is the trial going to be? I mean, I guess you could just show the video of the Oscars, but of course you couldn't prove it wasn't staged. You couldn't prove they didn't talk about it beforehand. There's all sorts of issues with that. Not to mention you'd be wasting all these resources, having a trial over one guy slapping another guy, and you would be doing it without, without the help of the purported victim. So what Alice is saying is really important. Now, those of you who followed this case in the inquest, you know, there has been some really interesting testimony from some people who don't want to testify. Now it is certainly the case that it is not as helpful as it would be if they wanted to testify because they are clearly not telling the whole truth, but you know, you do the best you can.
Before we move on, I want to tell you guys about my favorite new sunglasses from Blenders Eyewear. Fresh from San Diego, California, comes the only sunglasses brand I'm ever going to wear again. And I really am talking about Blenders Eyewear. You're going to be just as hooked when you see how awesome these shades are. I got the Keen Millennia and they just sit so comfortably on my face and they look fantastic. They are perfect to wear whether I'm sitting on the sidelines of my son's soccer game or driving with the top down because spring has sprung upon us. Chase Fisher started Blenders by selling his beachy shades out of backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. And his goal was just to create an adventurous mid-priced eyewear option with the same cool factor as other leading styles. Yeah, Alice, I'm always looking for great sunglasses. I picked up a pair of Planet 9 from Blenders and I absolutely love them and look unlike expensive big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past blenders are actually affordable so you're not going to cry as much when the inevitable happens and it's not just sunglasses blenders has prescription glasses readers and blue lights as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories. Live life in Ford motion with Blenders today. To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter promo code PROSECUTORSVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com, code PROSECUTORSVIP for 15% off. Blenders, rocked with pride worldwide. Alice, we've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know that every day somebody tells you that you just have to listen to some podcast, and you nod, and you say, sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusion about what's happening, even inside your own brain. There's something for everyone, including true crime fans. Check out the episode with Sammy the Bull Gravano or hear from Amanda Knox herself about the ordeal that she went through when she was falsely accused of crime. Jordan's always focused on pulling useful, practical insights out of his brilliant guests. And we're not talking about pop psychology or wishy-washy self-help stuff here. These episodes are loaded with bits of wisdom that you can use to legitimately change your mind and improve your life right away. So we really enjoy this show and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Alice, I'm so excited to talk about one of our favorite sponsors, Magic Spoon. And I'm not just saying that. I literally had Magic Spoon cereal for dinner tonight. Look, guys, I know a lot of y'all are like me. You love cereal, but you can't eat it because it's full of sugar and full of junk you don't need. You're trying to cut down on the carbs. You're trying to cut out the sugar. And cereal is one of those things that goes. And if you're like me and you're trying to do a keto diet, particularly, you can't have cereal. Well, that's where Magic Spoon comes in. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs, and only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. The variety pack has four flavors, and they include cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. I love mixing the cocoa with the peanut butter because it tastes exactly like a peanut butter cup, but it's nutritious. So go to magicspoon.com slash prosecute to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code prosecute at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash prosecute and use the code prosecute to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. 
Now let's talk about some unusual aspects of this case, and there are so many. Let's start with the police's initial investigation. So the police's initial investigation colored everything else about this case. After Sally reported her mother missing, the police categorized it as an incident rather than a missing persons report. The reason seems to be their assumption that Marion was an adult woman who had struck out on her own and it was likely she didn't want to be found by her kids. This assumption in place, they were then predisposed to confirm it with their limited investigation. The police started in a good enough place talking to bank employees who dealt directly with Marion and they felt confident that it was indeed Marion they spoke to. Now, what happened next is a little fuzzy. It's clear that the police never saw Marion. It's not as clear whether anyone at the force ever spoke to her. Some reports seem to indicate that a police officer with Queensland spoke to Marion. Queensland was not the police department in charge of the investigation, though. That was NSW. NSW appears to have only spoken to bank security officers who had contacted Marion. They said that she had told them she wanted no contact with her children, family, and friends. She also told them personal details that they took as proof that they had the right person. We've talked a lot on our show about going to the primary sources, right? We digest court transcripts and police reports for you, but we always tell you, you go read the police reports yourselves. You read the trial transcripts yourselves because there's no, there's really no substitute for the primary source. And in this case, especially when you're investigating a potential missing person or potentially someone whose identity has been stolen, it's important to go to the very person whose identity is the center of it, Marion in this case, right? And so it's very interesting that the police in classifying this as an incident and not missing person feel satisfied that speaking to bank tellers and bank employees is enough. But the bank employees aren't police officers. They may not have been asking questions in order to ascertain the identity, the real identity of Marion. They were just doing a bank transaction. What they were interested in is, does this person have the authority to take out the money and someone going to the bank to take out money from someone's account, even if they are not the identity of the person owning the bank account, probably goes armed with that information, right? So you begin to see some problems with just going to the bank employees to understand whether Marion is the one taking out money. The bank employees also conveyed to the police facts, including that Sally had not deposited the money for the car she was supposed to sell for her mother into the bank account, as they had previously agreed. Finding out this information from the police, they decided it was enough for the purposes of their inquiry. Had they followed up and insisted on an in-person meeting, gotten the information that Marion was possibly in a new relationship and with whom, it's possible that we wouldn't actually be talking about this case today. They may have gotten to the bottom of it back then. But you can see how the initial assumptions made about the case kind of drove the type of investigation that took place thereafter. I think this was the key moment in all of this because as we're going to discuss, whatever ended up happening to Marion, I think she was definitely alive at this point. And if the police had just taken one more step and just gone and seen her, if they had just taken the difficult step, the one that requires you to do more than pick up a phone, but actually get in your car and drive out and see her. If they had done that, made a report, confirmed that she was alive, but also confirmed who she was with, I think that really would have headed off any foul play that was going to happen. Because I think at that point, if there was someone who was involved with Marion at that point, they would kind of realize I can't do anything to her because the police know who I am. They know that I'm involved with her. If she disappears for real, that's going to be a problem for me. But they didn't do that. And I think that really set up the rest of this story. That decision not to take that one simple step is why we're here. Let's talk about the Southport School. We, we said that the Southport School is a prestigious boys' school in Southport. 
in New South Wales in Australia, but it was in the midst of trouble when Marion was teaching there. There were accusations, accusations that have only grown louder, that some of the teachers had sexually abused the children. In fact, as we've discussed, after Marion received the Teacher of the Year Award, there were even rumors at the school that she was an abuser. Now, this seems to be without basis, and The Lady Vanishes, I think, is pretty much confirmed that Marion had nothing to do with this, and in fact, one of the people spreading the rumors is now suspected of being one of the abusers. But whatever the case, it was a troubled situation, and it was one that caused Marion a great deal of stress in the months immediately prior to her departure. And I think you can look at this one of two ways. It could just be that, that this was a stressor. It was something that she wanted to get away from and something that would have made it attractive if there was an opportunity to get away from it. Now, if you take a darker view and you reject sort of what the Lady Vanishes seems to have found, this is a motive for Marion to disappear. If Marion actually wanted to disappear and start a new life, this is a pretty powerful impetus for it if she felt like the walls were closing in around her. But given what we know, it seems like that is not the case. Right. If anything, it it could explain why she wanted to get away for a little bit of time. But in kind of finding out more about Marion's background and history, if this were just an allegation causing stress and she had no part in it, you would think that she would then resurface a few months later being away from the stress of the situation and the, the accusers. And it does seem to be the case that she was not an abuser. And so disappearing for a small amount of time might make sense to get away from stressors, but disappearing for years, decades, doesn't seem to fit the profile of the Marion that we are coming to know through this investigation. Let's talk about Marion's relationships. We heard a little bit about it and maybe some mystery man near the last time that Sally saw her. But Marion had been married three times and everyone agrees that she craved a loving, stable relationship. Frankly, like probably most of us do. She never got over her first husband, Johnny Warren, that soccer player. And the loss of that relationship seems to have haunted her for the rest of her life. This is from her daughter's telling. Her daughter said that that was the love of her life that she spent the rest of her life chasing and that she could never quite get over. They were young. It was a whirlwind. He was at the peak of his career and it was probably just not the right time for them. Nevertheless, she never stopped loving him, it seems, even though she was married two other times and had children following that initial relationship. It may have also played a role in her disappearance. Maybe she was chasing after the idea of what that life could have been like. And if someone represented themselves as being very close to Johnny, you know, her her one true love, you can see how she may have been swayed in a moment of weakness to think that this was the way to kind of reclaim the life that she um, longed for. And that brings us to the man at the gas station. So the night that Sally and her fiance, Chris, saw Marion at the gas station, we talked about she was in her car and there was a man in the car. Well, earlier that night, Chris had been at Marion's home helping her pack up boxes. Chris was in the middle of a box, literally in the middle of packing a box when Marion appeared uneasy. She asked him the time and when he told her, she immediately told him he had to go. He had to leave and he had to leave right now. Chris said, I'll leave after I finish this box, but she's adamant. No, you can't even finish that box. You just got to go. So he went, he thought this was strange. He thought this was rude. He was helping Marion and all of a sudden she's basically throwing her, throwing him out of her home. And Sally said that when they later spotted Marion that night and the stranger at the gas station, Marion appeared startled. And she immediately jumped in her car and sped away. Sally thought this was weird. And when Sally asked Marion about it later, she just kind of played it off saying that it was a friend who wanted to take her out for a drink. Now, the problem with that is Marion didn't drink. Sally didn't think much of it at the time. But then once her mother disappeared, she realized it might have been one of those things 
that was far more significant than it appeared at first glance. Yeah, again, this is not in line with Marion's personality at the time, right? She was very close to Sally. She was very close to Chris. And they seem to have a very close relationship where they wouldn't have any sort of secrets from each other. So even back then, of course, hindsight 2020, Sally found this to be weird. Now let's talk about Marion's exit and entry cards into the country. When Marion left Australia, she used her new name, the one that none of her family members knew about, Florabella Natalia Marion Remacall. Marion indicated that she was headed to England, though the customs officer changed that to South Korea on the exit card. This indicated that rather than her flight taking her to Tokyo and then England, it actually terminated in South Korea. She would have flown from there to England. Now, why she stopped in South Korea is unknown. Marion indicated that her final destination was Europe, though the customs agent changed that to Luxembourg. Marion checked she never intended to return to Australia. She indicated that she was divorced. But someone using Marion's passport did return to Australia. Upon arriving, Marion checked that she was married, that she lived in Luxembourg, and that she was a housewife. Details that are very different than what her exit card said. She stated that she would be staying in Australia for three days. The passport was never used again. When Sally looked at both cards, the entry and the exit cards, she confirmed that the handwriting on both of those cards was her mother's. Other handwriting experts could not say for certain that the handwriting was the same, but they did testify that they had strong similarities. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. What it seems like happened, and those of you who've ever traveled internationally, if you get a customs agent or a border guard who's particularly, I guess, good at his job is one way to put it, they may ask you a lot of questions. Like you fill out that little card and you're like, why are you asking me these questions? It's all on the card. Well, what seems like happened here is Marion, probably she put England on her card because that's where she was eventually going to end up. But it seems like in reality, she was going to stop in South Korea for some period of time. I mean, I'm imagining a few days and probably the border guard was like, oh, well, if you're going to stop in South Korea first, then South Korea is your exit destination for our purposes. And then when you leave South Korea, you'll put England on anything you fill out there. That's what I'm imagining happened there. Then she puts Europe as her sort of final destination where she's going to stay. And he would have just asked her to clarify where in Europe are you going to be? And she would have said Luxembourg. And then you see that when she comes back, Luxembourg comes up again, but now she's married. She's only going to stay for three days. She never uses the passport again. The handwriting, it seems like it's pretty clear that it's Marion's on both. And this is important because one of the questions is, did Marion come back on August 3rd after that phone call? Or was it someone impersonating her? I'll just say as an initial matter, impersonating Marion to re-enter Australia seems like a huge risk. I don't even know why you would do that. I don't know why you would need to do that. Even if you were coming to Australia to steal all her stuff, you don't have to use her name on your entry card, right? You could just come in like a, a million other tourists are coming in, go to the bank. Then you might impersonate her. You might impersonate her at that point, but I don't really know why you would need to do it at the entry point. The handwriting is pretty convincing. Especially because it's not like her name is known in that area, so you don't need to make a record of her returning, right? Because who we think would potentially be impersonating her is likely a man. We, if we think this is sort of a, a relationship gone wrong situation and she was spotted with that man right before she left, if the idea is it's a, a man impersonating her, that would be very difficult. And also, like you said, what's the point? There's so much risk. You get deported. You get stopped. You draw the attention of police and also international law enforcement You know, because you're crossing – different countries. There's no need to do that because you gain nothing for purposes of draining her bank account by making an, an entry 
record for her. The bank doesn't check that she came back from her trip in order to let her remove money from her account, for example. Just, you know, putting my cards on the table on this, I am 99.99% sure that Marion is the person who came back into Australia on that day. I think that's a fair bet because, again, there's there's no reason. In fact, she was hiding the fact that she came back to Australia. So there's no reason for someone to pretend to be her to come back. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, all you loyal listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive of how much you want to pay for car insurance. Then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. All right, ladies, let's talk about something that all of us think about, and that's our hormonal fluctuations within our body throughout our lifetime. Well, thanks to Bonafide, who has created an alternative to effectively relieve these symptoms, we have a way to get relief without compromise. Bonafide provides women with naturally powerful remedies to safely treat the natural symptoms that occur throughout our lives, from PMS to menopause and everything else along the way. It's naturally sourced, it's non-prescription solutions that treat our health issues, and the ingredients are from nature, and so they can maximize effectiveness and relief. And better yet, it's clinically validated because the ingredients in every bona fide product are the result of thorough research, development, and clinical trials. Give bona fide a try today. No hormones and no prescription required. Real relief without compromise. To get 20% off your first purchase when you subscribe to any product and up to 56% when you subscribe to multiple products, go to hellobonafide.com slash prosecutors and use promo code prosecutors. That's hellobonafide.com slash prosecutors for up to 56% off at Check out for best prices and free shipping. Go directly to hellobonafide.com slash prosecutors. Guys, last week was brutal. Work was busy. Home life was busy. There were soccer practices for my kids. It was so hard to get everyone where they needed to be and get them fed. Thank goodness for HelloFresh. I truly think, Brett, that HelloFresh fed my family all of last week from their farm fresh pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to my doorstep. It was a dream. It skips trips to the grocery store for me, and I can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. My kids absolutely love this zucchini pork sausage pasta and gobbled it up. I've made it many times since the first package arrived because they like it so much. And I know you guys are wondering, do Brett and Alice really love HelloFresh this much? And the answer is yes. We love HelloFresh. HelloFresh is awesome. I'm like a HelloFresh missionary or something, trying to get more people with HelloFresh. And you guys should join us on HelloFresh. Look, they have fit and wholesome recipes for satisfying and nutritious meals that you can feel good about with six recipes per week to choose from, including low calorie and carb conscious options if that's what you're into. So join us on the HelloFresh train. Go to HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for up to 16 free meals and three gifts. That's hellofresh.com slash TP16, code TP16, for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. And don't forget, guys, it's not just HelloFresh. 
Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I know we both love switching between the brands, and now our listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with us. So go to HelloFresh.com slash TP16, use code TP16, and find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So let's talk about one of the craziest things about the Lady Vanishes podcast. So, you know, if you ask the question, can podcast change the entire trajectory of an investigation, the Lady Vanishes answers that question. So the Lady Vanishes, they do this podcast. The whole reason was to raise interest in this story and to have people look into the story more, right? So they're getting this information out. They're getting this information out about Marion changing her name, that very interesting last name. Well, a listener decides, I'm going to see if I can find that name anywhere in Australia. And sure enough, this person, this random person out there listening to this podcast is able to locate an advertisement for companionship in a French language newspaper. Now, this... This ad was placed in 1994, which is a few years before Marion disappeared. But what it says is very interesting. It reads, well, first of all, it's written in French. It's actually written in Luxembourgese, which is a dialect of French, I guess. And I'm not going to attempt to read it to you in in that language. I'm going to read you the English translation. So here's what it says. A tall 47-year-old single man with brown hair a non-smoker who is cultured, intelligent, and can speak a number of languages. He owns multiple properties or businesses and is highly motivated. He is warm and welcoming, but also quite serious. He is looking for an unattached lady with a view for a permanent relationship or marriage. Now, I feel like anybody who read that today, it's like screams. There's like red lights going off and red flags going up everywhere about this, but that's what this person puts in this in this French newspaper. They also include the initials BCBG, which apparently means bon chic, bon genre. And this is a phrase in French that indicates that the writer is a wealthy person of fine breeding. In America, you might call them old money. In Europe, think more along the lines of nobility. Now, what is interesting about this advertisement is it is signed M.F. Rimical, which is the same last name as Marion would use when she changed her name. And an investigation by the Lady Vanishes, once they have this, reveals that Rimical is a name that was not used really anywhere in Australia and was in fact quite rare around the world. It was primarily used by a few families in Belgium and, you guessed it, Luxembourg. The same country Marion would list as her home on her reentry card. And that's, and we heard previously by the Lady Vanishes podcast that the MF Remacall initials and name is just not a common one. I've never heard Remacall. This is certainly quite the coincidence that we're seeing here and also shows that all that transpired may have transpired far earlier than we thought. It may well precede any allegations of the you know, sexual misconduct or the assault at the school that we now know is likely to be unfounded and also in advance of her winning the teaching award. In other words, those things might actually end up being just red herrings in this story. Now, the Lady Vanishes podcast located a single F Remen call in all the world who matched the correct age as the person who wrote the advertisement. Fernand Remacall. Remacall was interesting for a couple reasons. One, he lived in Luxembourg. And remember, that is the dialect in which the advertisement was written in. And two, he played international soccer at the same time that Johnny Warren was playing for Australia. Johnny Warren being Marion's first husband, one true love. But when the podcast team contacted him, Fernand said he'd never been to Australia and that he'd never known a Marion Barter. His partner said she'd been with him for more than 40 years, well before that 1994 advertisement. In other words, 
Fernand Remacall's story seems to check out here that he's not actually the one writing the advertisement, it seems. Now, Fernand wasn't exactly happy to see the podcast team on his doorstep, and the relationship quickly soured. The Lady Vanishes team doubted Fernand's statements. He seemed like he was just too good a match. But it would turn out that they were wrong. So when the inquest began, it initially followed the podcast, looking at who Marion was, the initial investigation into her disappearance, the things that were discovered in the reinvestigation. But when the inquest reopened in 2022, the lead investigator dropped a bombshell. The police had located a new witness, Rick Blum, and the things they learned about him changed everything about the investigation. Blum told investigators he had first met Marion in Italy in the 1960s when she was on tour with her soccer star husband, Johnny. He said that he and Marion had a brief fling, but then he didn't see her again for 30 years when he answered a personal ad in a Gold Coast newspaper seeking companionship. When he answered the ad, he was shocked to see it was Marion, his old flame. He said they spent the next few nights together, and at some point, Marion told him she was leaving Australia to start a school in England. She asked him if she could store some boxes at his place. After some time, she returned with a man. He was tall with dark hair, and he wore a blue uniform with some sort of gold bands on the side, the kind you might expect a pilot to wear. If red flags are popping up all over the place for you, well, they should. You know, it's interesting. He mentions this person wearing this uniform with the gold bands on the side that makes you think he might be a pilot. The interesting thing about that is if you listen to the Lady Vanishes podcast, they talk about how Marion might have been interested in a man who was a pilot who had a son at the boys' school. And so you have to wonder... Did this person actually show up or had Mr. Blum actually listened to the podcast and sort of developed this idea in his own mind? Now, you might be asking, why would we not believe what Mr. Blum has to say? Well, it didn't take long for the police to realize that Rick Blum, who also pronounces his name Rick Bloom, he can't even decide how to pronounce his name, was not actually his name. Rather, he was born Willie Wooters in Belgium. And I'm sure, I'm sorry to everyone listening in Belgium, I'm sure Wooters is not actually pronounced that way, but that's the way I'm going to pronounce it. So I look forward to hearing how you actually pronounce that. He spent most of the 1970s in French prisons for any number of crimes, including fraud, embezzlement, identity theft, and other crimes along those lines. And to make things even more interesting, the police found a number of women from Australia and elsewhere who had been in relationships with Blum that came to a bad end when they discovered he wasn't who he said he was. To some of these women, Blum presented himself as a wealthy businessman with an estate in Western Australia and hundreds of acres of valuable timber. To others... He suggested vaguely that he was the heir to some European fortune and that that these women should leave their boring lives behind and come with him to rebuild in some luxurious location like the French Riviera. Several of these women actually testified at the inquest that Blum had defrauded them out of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in cash and property and his mo was pretty similar each time he would do this number one he would convince them that he was in love with them and that they were going to build this amazing new life together he would then convince them to do things like sell their home or put his name on the deeds to their property or give him power of attorney so that he could sign documents for them and he would take them on whirlwind trips to europe And while doing so, he would slowly drive a wedge between them and their families. And then when things inevitably fell apart, he would abandon them or in some cases, even threaten 
violence. These women described him in his prime as tall with dark hair. Now, Bloom went by many, many more names, as many as 30. He had 10 Australian passports under eight different names, but there was only one name that interested the police, Fernand Remacol. That's right. The same Fernand Remacol that the Lady Vanishes had tracked down in Luxembourg. In fact, Blum had changed his name and received an identification document for Remencall in Australia. Not only did he use his name, but the same birth date. How did Blum learn of the name? He had lived in Luxembourg. When the podcast spoke to Remencall in Luxembourg, he noted that his family had come from Belgium. Blum was Belgium himself. But most shockingly, Blum, under yet another name, had seduced Fernand Remencall's first wife. Brett, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you really can't. I mean, this is I, like... This is just... Just the twists and turns, and this is not a story. I mean, this was uncovered by the podcast, which is what's so amazing about their, their investigative digging. Now, how can this be? How did this happen? Well, Blum told her that he was a British intelligent agent and suggested they sail around the world together. When she found out that Blum was already married, she cut off the relationship, but not before introducing him to her husband and other important people in Luxembourg. Now, when the police tracked down the telephone number for the advertisement in 1994 under the name M.F. Remacall, it probably will not surprise you what they found. The number was registered to, you guessed it, Blum, under yet another of his aliases. On June 22, 1997, Marion left Australia via Brisbane through Tokyo. On August 2nd, she returned to Australia via the Brisbane airport, as we see in her exit and entry cards. On June 17th, 1997, just a few days before Marion left Australia, Blum left Australia via, via Brisbane through Tokyo, just like Marion. On July 31st, a few days before Marion's entry card indicated her passport was used to come back in, Blum returned to Australia via Brisbane Airport. And currently in the inquest, Blum is on the stand. He's been on the stand for many days answering many questions. And you guys, you've got, even if you don't listen to any of the rest of the podcast, just listen to the last few episodes when he is testifying, because all it is, is them reading the transcript. So they have one person who's playing the role of the prosecutor, and then they have someone playing the role of him. And just, it's, it's insane to listen to. They confront him with all of these allegations by all these different women, and he constantly just says they're making it up or, well, they must be telling a joke. He spins one tale that one of the women who was a 50 year old lady from Australia really wanted to be a belly dancer in Europe. And so <laughs> he took her to Europe to give her this opportunity to be a belly dancer because that was her dream. And at one point he literally says, <laughs> that she seduced him with her dancing. And so he just, he didn't, he couldn't do anything else. She, he was so seduced by her. He, he basically says that she, she did a belly dance naked and he was, he was just mesmerized by it. And from that point forward, he had to, these are the kind of things that he's saying on the stand. You got to listen to it. And it's, it's funny because usually, even though it's a coroner's inquest, the coroner is more like a judge and she has an advocate who is sort of acting as the solicitor who's actually asking the questions. But every now and then Bloom will say something so absurd that she will interrupt and she'll be like, wait a second, what she did, what? And, and he'll have to repeat it. So it's totally worth listening to. And you can sort of decide for yourself whether or not you find him compelling. As I said, by the time you hear this last episode, we'll only be about a week away from the inquest restarting and he will still be on the stand. So there may yet be more information to come out. This is a great time to get involved in this case because 
it is just all of this craziness is happening even as we speak and all the things we just discussed we have learned in the last couple months through this inquest and we wouldn't learn any of it without the lady vanishes so Having said all that, let's talk about theories. I almost feel like there's no point in talking about theories because I hope that most of you out there who've been listening to our podcast have a pretty good idea of what probably happened here. But we'll go ahead and, and do some theories. And we'll start with the first one, which was the one that everybody believed to be true, except for Sally. Sally was a lone voice crying in the wilderness about this, that Marion had just decided to disappear on her own. And I think even when the lady vanishes was well into the podcast before bloom shows up. I think it still was a pretty popular theory that Marion had just decided to start a new life. Maybe she really did abuse a child at the school. Maybe she just was tired of her family. Maybe she wanted to leave her failed relationships behind. Whatever the case, this theory would tell you that Marion left on her own. And there were reasons to believe this. She changed her name without telling her family. She returned without telling them. And she told the investigators who found her that she wanted to remain alone. Still, if Marion wanted to disappear on her own, that doesn't mean that the dedicated efforts of the police would not have found her in the decades that followed. It's one thing to disappear and start a new life. It's another thing entirely to do it so well that even the police can't locate you or find any trace of you for the last 25 years. And yet, they have not been able to do so. In fact, since the initial contacts were made with her, no one has seen her again. And that makes the idea that Marion simply disappeared, that she, the lady vanishes, as it were, is highly, highly unlikely. This is not a Lori Ruff story. This is a story where the disappearance is just a smokescreen for something else. This is why this is such an interesting case for us to do in close proximity to Lori Ruff, who really did want to disappear. And you see that people don't just disappear into thin air here. So if that's not the case, then what if Marion was murdered by someone in Europe who then stole her identity? So could Marion have been murdered in Europe when she was just vacationing? She was finally taking this trip after, you know, some hard earned time teaching and she'd reached the peak of her career and was just having a good time in Europe when someone murdered her and then stole her identity and in doing so returned to Australia. So entering the country as Marion when they were not Marion and they did that in order to steal her money. After all, even the people who claim to have located Marion never actually spoke to her. Instead, they relied on the words of the bank officials that they recognized Marion. There's also the fact that the money she had transferred to England to support her trip had, has never been touched. If Marion was the one draining her account, why wouldn't she drain the money that she had transferred over to England as well? It's true that Sally recognized her mother's handwriting, but Sally's not an expert necessarily on handwriting samples, but experts could not be sure. And it's possible that the person who had stolen Marion's identity was just able to mimic Marion's handwriting in a way that it fooled Sally. Still, if this were someone who had murdered Marion, there would have been no reason to use her passport to re-enter Australia as we spoke about earlier. It was only necessary to convince the bank manager that the person was Marion. So they could have done so by coming into Australia on a wholly other passport. It didn't have to be Marion's. Again, like we said, the bank manager didn't have to look at entry and exit cards because they just deal with money and bank transactions, not international affairs. And it would be extremely risky to show up at a bank in Australia pretending to be someone, particularly in the small towns where the money was taken out, where everybody knows each other or at least has a familiarity with pe what people look like. In reality, it's likely that whatever happened to Marion happened after she herself had drained her own accounts. And I think that brings us to the third theory, which is Marion was murdered by someone she knew in Australia. Far be it from us to suggest someone is a murderer in the middle of an investigation. So let's just talk about a hypothetical. 
Imagine a woman in her 50s. She's successful in her career, but even that success comes with some pain. And even at the height of accomplishment, when she's done everything that she could possibly want to do, it doesn't bring her joy. And in fact, because of that success, there's rumors and jealousy, and she finds herself sinking into depression. She's lonely. She wants love, but she's been divorced three times, and she's never gotten over the love of her life, her first husband. She's not getting any younger. Life seems like a dead end. And then, magically, as if out of the blue, she meets someone. They're exciting, exotic, successful. They tell her, hey, I'm from Luxembourg, and wouldn't you know it, I'm a former soccer player and just like the love of your life. This is something about Fernand Rimical that we mentioned briefly that might be important. He was also a high quality soccer player for Luxembourg at the time that Johnny Warren was playing for Australia. And so wouldn't this just feel like fate? This woman meeting this former soccer player, a person who played the same sport as as her her long lost love and this person says look i'm going to whisk you away on an adventure it's going to take her to europe to start a new life where all her dreams can come true you know there is one problem though your children might not understand and this new lover suggests that Maybe it would be better just not to tell them until everything's settled, they can't do anything to stop it, and they just kind of have to accept it. Obviously, since she's going to be starting a new life in Europe, she doesn't need any property in Australia, and she might as well sell it. And she goes along. She quits her job. She sells her property. She changes her name. And why would she do that? Why would she change her name before she left for Europe? Well, it turns out that if you don't change your name before you leave Australia, you can't change it until you come back. So if you're going to get married to somebody in Europe, you want to go ahead and change your name to their name so that then when you're married, your name is already set. Then you imagine this woman heads off to Europe. She gets married. Her children know nothing. But then she runs into a problem. She can't access the money in her Australian account from Europe. It turns out that she has signed up for a high-performance savings account that has some restrictions, including that she can only take out $5,000 a day and likely that she can only take it out from an Australian bank. This part's a little fuzzy. The, uh, the inquest did talk to some people from the bank, but they didn't nail this down about whether or not she could have gotten the money out from another country, but it seems like she probably couldn't, couldn't have, given the fact that she came back to Australia. So she goes back to Australia to get this money, but while she's there, run into a problem. The kids find out about what's happening. They find out that she started this plan. They find out that she's draining the bank account and this irritates you because you're on the verge of starting this new amazing life and all of a sudden your kids are intervening and so you tell investigators that i want to talk to them and you imagine once once i'm settled then i'll reach out to them on my own terms and i can set things up now here's the problem once this person does that she becomes the perfect victim at this point, no one's looking for you, but it's better than that. It's better than the fact that no one's looking for you. They have found you, and you have made it clear that you don't want to be found. So now the police are inclined not to look for you at all. And if someone were to murder you and get rid of the body by dumping it in the ocean or burying it in the outback, no one would ever be the wiser. They would just assume you were doing exactly what you told them. You were living out your new life. And your new husband, the man you trusted, the man who you've given all your money to and all your property to, the man who is actually a con man who has run this scam a hundred times before, would have access to everything you have with no one left to question him about it. And he would have gotten away with it too were it not for a pesky podcast. I mean, Brett, this is truly amazing. 
there are a couple instances we can point to where a podcast is able to develop leads, massive leads and what have been cold cases. But this is something altogether special because this wasn't a cold case. It was a non-case until the Lady Vanishes podcast took an interest in it. And it could have easily led nowhere because like you said at the beginning of our first episode in this case, it sounded innocent enough. The lady was found. People talked to her. She just wanted a new life for whatever reason. We may not have understood the dynamics of her family. Honestly, I don't think this was necessarily sloppy police work. It, they probably get a lot of calls from family members, especially if it's like adult children of grown people. Adults can do whatever they want, right? There's no there's no mandate that they talk to their children. They did a, a level of investigation that probably made sense for the type of case this was going to be. And until this podcast came around, there was no cold case. There was no issue. Um, so what amazing work they've they've really done in uncovering this. And I think what you've just said, it's what happened. I mean, that's what the evidence is in front of us right now. And it's kind of just a matter of time before the rest of the facts bear out. But Blum, Rick Blum himself, has already placed him right there with Marion before she essentially disappeared. And we see this sometimes where people know that they are their fingerprints or their DNA or security footage is going to find them at the scene of the crime. So they spin up some story that makes no logical, rational sense as to why you'd be the last person to be there to see them before the disappearance happened or before the crime occurred. So this is going to be really interesting to see how it ultimately plays out. But I think the theory you've laid out is the most likely is most likely what happened. Yeah, and it's one of those cases where I don't know if the family will ever see justice just because so much time has passed. And this may be one of those cases where we all know what happened, but proving it beyond a reasonable doubt might be hard. I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty convinced. I feel like if you laid out the evidence to me and I was on a jury, I could find this person guilty of basically anything you wanted to charge them with. But we'll see how that goes. A couple of things that I think are just, I mean, he cannot get away from this advertisement. I mean, that's the big one, right? Like he tries to spin up this story about, he just happened to run into her and they spent this time together. And like you were saying, he's trying to explain why he would have seen her. But one thing he's never really able to explain is this advertisement. Now it was 1994. We don't know that Marion ever saw it, but what we can know for certain is that Marion was involved with someone named Rimical because she changed her name to Rimical and there aren't anybody named Rimical in Australia. And if you look at what he wrote in that ad, I mean, he lays out the scheme. He lays out exactly how he's going to approach it. And it's the same way he approached it with these other women that he scammed presenting himself as this bon vivant, this guy who's going to change their lives. And he's, as he says, cultured, intelligent, can speak a number of languages, owns multiple properties and businesses, and is highly motivated. I mean, come on, you know, and that's exactly what he presented to her when he saw her in Australia, when he came into contact with her, however he did, and who knows how he did. You know, he says this whole thing that they knew each other in Italy. I don't believe that. I don't believe that they had some relationship in Italy. I think that's entirely BS. I think this was probably the first time they had met. It was sometime around that sort of April 1997 time when Marion went from this is where she was going to be to all of a sudden she's selling her house, changing her name, quitting her job, right? At some point prior to that, he had begun this process of seducing her. He's the man that Sally's fiance, now husband, saw, or, or excuse me, that Sally saw at the McDonald's. He is the reason that Marion had her fiance leave, Sally's fiance leave, because he was coming over. And she knew that she was not supposed to tell them about him. It's just so obvious how this all went down. And I know some of you, you know, we talked about that advertisement and it's like, how could anybody fall for that? Red flags and everything else. And I just want to point to something, Cold Case Murder Mysteries, which is a podcast I mentioned on occasion, some of you've listened to it. Some of you have hated it. Some of you have loved it, which is what I tell people will always happen if you listen to it. But he's currently doing a, 
uh, six part series on Delphi. And it's very interesting in the way his are always very interesting. But he said something in one of the episodes that stuck with me and I thought applied to this so well. He said, you don't get catfished because you are stupid. You get catfished because you are hurting. And that was Marion. Marion was the perfect victim here. She was just waiting to be taken advantage of by somebody who could prey on her disappointments and her pain and use it against her. And I think that's exactly what happened here. Oh, Brett, that hit so deep. And I hope you guys all hear it out there, whether you've been a victim of being catfished to a lesser degree, not necessarily you know, even someone draining your bank account or just being fooled into something, please hear what Brett just said. I mean, it's not because you are stupid. We see things that we want to see when we are deeply hurting and you don't know the struggles in each other in each person's life. We only happen to know a bit more about Marion's life because there's this entire podcast devoted to her and her family member, Sally, wanted to get to the bottom of this. But you know, just remember that. Be kind to each other. And before you start pointing fingers um, about who's the victim in these crimes, I'd like to point out that we see this all the time. Any of us can be the victim in the right situation. And I think we are seeing that here with Marion. And one other point on that, and then I want to step on my soapbox for a second because I have a soapbox thing I want to talk about. But first, just related to this case and related to what Alice just said, the other really important part of this is don't let the fact that you feel ashamed or embarrassed that you were fooled stop you from seeking justice. Because these people who do this, they are professionals at it. That's why that's why you fell victim to it. Not because, like Al said, like Cold Case Murder Mystery said, not because you're dumb, not because you're stupid, but because these people know how to find the triggers that you have and use them against you. Report those people because they will only get more brazen. They will only take advantage of more people. And in some cases, it may eventually lead to a murder like we've seen here. So I know that 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 is one of the biggest obstacles law enforcement faces in these cases is people. People are so embarrassed by what happened that they don't want to report it. And I will tell you, there is one other possibility that could have happened in this case. It might be the one area of reasonable doubt you might even have if this person were charged with murder. Imagine if everything we said happened, Marion cuts off her family, she sells her home, she quits her job, she gives all her money to this guy, and then he drops her. He abandons her somewhere. He breaks up with her, he leaves her, right? One other possibility might be that Marion was so shattered by that and so embarrassed by it and so feeling like she could never go home because of what she did that she might have even taken her own life under that sort of, sort of circumstance. And that's something you see too in cases like this because when someone steals your entire life, sometimes it's hard to start over. And that's something we just can't know. I think if that had have happened, we probably would have found her. The one issue in this case that Sally's brought up a lot, there were a lot of Jane Doe's who could have been her mother that the police just never, they just never investigated, right? Because once again, they weren't looking. That's one big problem with the case, but we don't know exactly how it happened. But I think whatever happened to Marion, I think we know who's responsible ultimately. And it wasn't Marion. It was the person who chose to take advantage of her. So... So that's all I have to say about the case, sort of. But I do want to I want to talk about one other thing that I think is related to this case. So there is this ongoing debate on Twitter. And I know whenever I talk about ongoing debates on Twitter, I'm always I'm always it's a risky thing to even bring it up. But there's this ongoing debate in Twitter, and I think it's by people with the best intentions. But it sort of goes along the lines of if a podcast or a journalist is investigating something that happens to a victim and the victim's family wants them to stop. Should they stop? And it's sort of phrased in a way that the answer is supposed to be yes, that the podcast or the, or the investigator should heed the family's wishes and stop investigating if that's what the family wants them to do. And I understand the impetus behind this because there are all sorts of instances in which the families of victims and victims have been taken advantage of and their stories have been used in sensationalist ways to make money. But I do think 
take a look at what happened in this case, because there's a couple things. Number one, I don't know what, it, I don't know what the family means because the family isn't a real thing. The family is just made up of people. And if you recall, when we talked about this, everyone in Marion's family wanted Sally to stop. Sally was the only person who wanted to keep looking. Families aren't monoliths. They have a lot of different ways of thinking about this. And if Sally had listened to them, we wouldn't know anything about this. So that's the first thing. The second thing, imagine a world in which Sally agreed with her family and channel seven's like, you know what? We get it, but we think there's something here. Should channel seven have looked into this or not? Should they have heeded the family's wishes not to look into what happened to Marion or should they have dug into it? And I think what you have to always remember is while we should treat families with the utmost respect, your ultimate objective and your ultimate goal and your number one consideration always has to be the victim themselves and finding justice for the victim themselves. And it doesn't mean you do it in a way that's not respectful for families, but I think this notion that we should ever stop looking or stop investigating is one that can have dangerous consequences. And I feel like this podcast and what happened here shows you the power of, of what people are doing. I mean, crowdsourcing, we talk about this a lot. I mean, the lady vanishes, it was crowdsourcing as much as anything. Yeah. They had some real journalists on this, but at the end of the day, it wasn't the journalist who found the advertisement. It was a lady in England who was listening to the podcast and got on the internet and dug into some newspaper archives and somehow ended up in the French language newspaper in Australia and found this. So like I said, I'm not criticizing anybody. I know it comes from a good place, but I think we have to be very careful and just remember it's always about the victims. Whew, this was, this was more twists and turns than I expected. And like we said, the podcast continues. So there is actually more. I, I think that we'll probably have a, a follow-up at some point down the road. Definitely. And I certainly hope that at the end of this, it does result in justice for Marion and for closure for Sally and her family, obviously Bloom or Remical or Willie Wooters, whatever you want to call him. He's now in his eighties, I believe. So you would hope that at this point he would just come clean about anything that happened, but I don't think that's going to happen. But maybe once again, through all of the, the light that has been shown on this case, someone will come forward with more information and maybe we'll learn more about that at the end of April. Like I said, listen to the podcast, listen to Lady Vanishes. If you don't, we will keep you up to date on what's happening. Really interested to hear what you think about this case. Shoot us an email at prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at prosecutorspod. Join us on YouTube. Join Patreon. Come see us at CrimeCon. Whatever you want to do, we're interested in hearing more from you. Well, Alice, do you have anything else you want to add? No, we can't wait to see you guys at CrimeCon. It's fast approaching. So come join us. Brett, you and I need to talk about all the goodies we're going to bring for our fans. So it'll be a secret for you guys because we don't even know what it is yet. Yeah, there you go. There you go. It's a super secret. By the time you hear this, we'll be pretty close to CrimeCon, but maybe a week or two away. In any event, we've enjoyed this, but we will be back next week with a new case, new questions, and new answers. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. That tweet or whatever was the funniest thing in the whole wide world. This is the most boring thing I've ever heard. Well, you listen yeah, to it, lady. You, know, you don't have to share every opinion you ever Also, heard. turn I mean, it off. <laughs> I don't understand why you do that to somebody. I mean, it's so rude. That's such a rude thing to do. I know. It's you like, know? you know what? Your hair doesn't look good today. It's like, did you have to tell me? I, like, does it really like, matter? You know, I think you're so beautiful. But today, you look terrible. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? It's like, well, you know. You have such good fashion sense. What but, man, wrong? your outfit today. Wow. I mean, dude.
was a, a later from Morbid turned me on to this band called Ghost. Okay. Which is like a heavy metal band. Oh, from nice. Sweden. It was pretty good. And you know what I realized? And this is actually relevant to you know how they had the whole satanic panic and part of it was the kids would listen to heavy metal and it was like devil worshiping you know like, yep what i have come to realize about heavy metal is really it's just a bunch of nerds Stream the biggest movies and TV shows for free on Pluto TV. Watch movies like Titanic and G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra, plus TV shows like CSI and Star Trek The Next Generation. Starting this month, check out the 24-7 Stargate channel exclusively on Pluto TV, plus hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows absolutely free. Download the free Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start watching today.